everybody, it's Ms. Hamill and I'm here to talk to you about ecosystems and ecosystems are basically the structural and functional unit that is studied in ecology, which is the unit that we are talking about this week. Okay, so ecosystems are going to support themselves and they are going to be stable. So there's not much change when three conditions are met and they are the ear conditions, E-A-R. There must be a constant supply of energy the sun is the main source of energy for all life on earth. There must be living organisms that can convert energy into organic compounds. These are called autotrophs and they do so through photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. And there must be a recycling of material between organisms and the environment. So an example of an ecosystem would be an aquarium. It's a small ecosystem, but it's a stable environment and has the EAR factors. So energy, E, is applied to the ecosystem through light, and there are plants, A, for autotrophs, to change the light energy into organic molecules or glucose. And there's a recycling of material that occurs through photosynthesis and respiration. So during photosynthesis, the autotrophs or plants use the light energy and carbon dioxide to make glucose. And they give off oxygen, which is then used by the fish and snails that live in the aquarium during respiration. Then the animals are going to release the carbon dioxide that is used by the plant. So it's a constant recycling of nutrients. So there are different parts of ecosystems, and we're going to talk about the abiotic and biotic factors of the ecosystems. So abiotic factors are going to be the non-living parts of the environment, and they directly affect the organism's ability to live and reproduce. Abiotic factors can vary from place to place, and they can be a limiting factors, and that's going to keep a population at a particular level. So one example would be in a desert environment, the hot temperatures and very little water are example of limiting factors. Different species that live in the desert are going to be limited to those that can survive in extreme heat and very little water. Or they're adapted to hold on to water, such as a cactus that has its water in the middle of its stem. Um, parts of an ecosystem and we're going to talk about the biotic factors and these are going to be the living things that directly or indirectly affect the ecosystem. So biotic factors interact with other living organisms and the physical environment. So this could be um, two organisms living in the same space it could or competing for the same space. It could be um, two organisms that eat each other or one eats another. So these would be nutritional relationships, one organism eating another, or it could be a symbiotic relationship, which we'll talk about in a second. They could also be limiting factors, um, so disease or bacteria, predators, and food resources are examples of limiting factors. So nutritional relationships, like I said, involves a transfer of nutrients from one organism to the next within an ecosystem. It involves interactions between autotrophs or organisms that produce their own food and heterotrophs, which are organisms that must consume another organism for food. Um, the food chain is going to be um, a linear chain that starts with producers and one organism consumes another and it is the pathway of energy from one organism to the next. A food chain is going to be many food chains intertwined um, within a community. So you can see here a food chain would be the plant, the rabbit eats the plants, and then the fox eats the rabbit. That is one line. But you can see here the food web, there are many different interactions between organisms living in the same community. Okay, autotrophs are going to be organisms that can synthesize organic molecules from inorganic molecules. So they take energy and they make um, sugar or their own food um, from or inorganic molecules. These are producers. They can be photosynthetic using light or chemosynthetic using chemicals. And examples would be plants, 
protist and bacteria. They are going to be the base or the bottom of the food chain. And then heterotrophs are going to be organisms that cannot make their own organic molecules, so they cannot make their own food, and there are five different types. Herbivores are going to consume only plants or autotrophs. Um, they are called the primary level. And then we have carnivores, and they are going to consume only other animals. They are called secondary or tertiary consumers, depending on how high up they are or if they are a top predator or not. Then we have omnivores, which eat both plants and animals, and they could either be a first, second, or third level consumer. Example would be a bear or human. Scavengers are going to be organisms that only eat animals after they are already killed, um, usually second or third level consumers. A vulture or a hyena would be an example of this. Uh, they would eat, vultures would eat roadkill or organisms that are already dead. And then finally, decomposers, and they are very important. They are going to live on dead or decaying matter. Um, they are called detritivores or saporophytes and they include heterotrophic plants, fungi, and bacteria. So or heterotrophs would be everything from the grasshopper all the way around, and then the autotrophs would be the grass here. Okay, so how does energy flow throughout this ecosystem? Well, in an energy pyramid, each step of the food web, energy is going to be transferred to the next level. So from the sun to the plant, from the plant to the rabbit, from the rabbit to the snake, from the snake to the hawk. Now, people can think food chains and they think of one organism eating the next, but it's really the energy flow. So it's energy flowing from one organism to the next. And this transfer of energy is not very efficient. Only 10% of energy is passed from one level to the next um, that can actually be used. Most of this energy is lost maintaining homeostasis and through the production of heat. And the amount of usable energy decreases the higher the feeding level. So there'll be less energy at the top of the food chain or the food pyramid than at the bottom. The biomass pyramid is similar. The amount of organic matter in an ecosystem is considered its biomass, and the biomass pyramid shows the total amount of biomass at each feeding level. The higher the level, the less biomass, which is because there is less energy. So they're both related. So here's the, the pyramids. You can see that the producers have high energy and large population or biomass, and it gets decreasingly smaller as you go up the pyramid. So primary consumers have less than the producers, secondary consumers have less than the primary consumers, and tertiary consumers have less than all of the organisms below. Okay, next is the symbiotic relationships, and this is going to be interactions among different species in an ecosystem where they live in a close association with one another. So this is called symbiosis. So one member of the association is going to gain something by the other member. So mutualism is going to be a symbiotic relationship and with both organism benefits. Positive, positive. A honeybee pollinating a flower would be an example. The honeybee gets food and the flower benefits by pollination and transfer of the genetic material. Communalism is going to be a symbiotic relationship where one organism benefits and the other is not harmed. So it doesn't benefit, but it's not harmed. Example would be the remora, a small fish that attaches itself to the shark and it's going to get food um, whenever the shark feeds. And the shark pretty much gets nothing from that. Another example would be barnacles on a whale. And then parasites or parasitism would be when one organism or the parasite benefits and the other organism, the host, is harmed. So um, an example would be athlete's foot, which is a fungus that grows on humans' feet for nutrient. And it's very uncomfortable for the human, so they are harmed. Tapeworms benefit 
and the humans are harm. Heartworms in a dog, the tapeworm, or I'm sorry, the heartworm benefits, the dog is harmed. Okay, so the final thing is nutrient flow in our ecosystem. The same materials are reused or cycled, recycled in the ecosystem. So here's the R. So carbon and oxygen involves the process of photosynthesis and respiration. So during photosynthesis, it uses carbon dioxide and produces oxygen, and respiration uses that oxygen and produces carbon dioxide. So it's a constant interaction between autotrophs and heterotrophs in the ecosystem. The water cycle is something you've learned about since you were a child. It involves the processes of photosynthesis, transpiration, which is the movement of water um, through a plant. We'll do a lab with that in the future. Evaporation, condensation, respiration, and excretion. Okay, the next cycle is the nitrogen cycle, and it's going to involve decomposers and other types of soil bacteria, which are going to break down and convert nitrogenous waste and, which could be uh, urine, ammonia, and other remains of dead organisms into material that is usable by autotrophs, so in the form of nitrates. They can take the nitrates, they become a fertilizer for the autotrophs, and it helps them to grow and develop. All right, so, all right, well, that's our lecture about ecosystems, and I hope it's taught you a little bit more and you gain a little bit better understanding about the ecosystems and the interaction within the ecosystem. Now, it is your job to go out there and be an active, positive part of your ecosystem. Uh, remember to turn off your lights when you leave a room, turn off your water, never litter, and just be a protector for our planet that we live on. All right, guys, have a great night.